All right, Isaiah chapter 55. If you would, please stand in honor of God's word. The lights seem bright tonight, don't they? Maybe it's just the Lord laid on my heart such a great message, and I'm so excited about it. So anyway, what this is, this is absolutely some of my favorite, and I don't say that every year or every week, but I really mean it this, this week. Uh, <laughs> Isaiah 55, 6, we'll start there. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth into bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word go forth out of my mouth, and it shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. That's a great place for an amen, don't you think? Wow. For as you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace, the mountains and the hills shall break forth uh, before you into singing. All the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorns shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we are overwhelmed by your word. And God, it's so evident that your thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. God, your ways are so much higher than our ways. And God, we aspire to think like you think. We aspire that our ways would be your ways. God, we're not trying to drag you down to our level. We want to aspire to your level. Oh, God, thank you for your Holy Spirit, how it guides us, how it shares with us when we're wrong, when we need to repent, how it congratulates us when we're right. God, I thank you for each thing that's happening on our campus and Oh, oh, Lord, for the kids that are doing Bible drill, what a blessing. And God, thank you for their leaders and those that are working with minor praise and major praise. God, we appreciate the sacrifice that they're making. God, be with our student ministry, with Andrew and Heather and Macy and Travis. And God, I pray that you would just watch over them and, and give them discernment and give them wisdom as they deal with the students. God, be with our children's ministry right now, our RAs and GA leaders. God, I thank you so much for Miss Tree and her leadership. God, for Amy and for Paula and for Sophie and for Debbie. And God, I just pray your anointing of the Holy Spirit over them and each department they're at. God, I love walking past the choir room and listening to the choir practice for Sunday and for Jenna and Brother Billy and the work that they're doing there. And, and, and God, thank you for each part, for our kitchen crew, for those guys working security. God, for those that are watching our parking lot. God, thank you for each person and then those that are here tonight. I thank you and I pray that you just bless them in a very special way. God, I pray that you'll be with those that right now are in the hospital. God, that uh, are having a tough time and and I just pray that you put your healing hand on them and, Lord, that you would be glorified through healing them or giving them the ultimate healing. God, be with those that are grieving the loss of loved ones. We pray you'll be with our re-engage with Brother Brian as he's leading them. God, I thank you for our grief share with Oya as she leads people that are grieving the loss of family members. And uh, God, thank you. Thank you for everything on this campus. We give you all glory and power and, and praise. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we know that Isaiah chapter 55 begins with a call to salvation. And it's kind of like an invitation that Isaiah and God is giving to individuals that need, need to be saved. And it's the result of Isaiah 53 which gives us the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. By his stripes we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has, has turned to his own way. But the Lord hath laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So because of Isaiah 53, now we come to Isaiah 55, which says and begins in verse 1 by saying, Ho, come, everyone that thirsteth. Come ye to the waters, he that hath no money. Come ye, buy, eat. Come, 
buy wine and milk without money, without price. Come, and the hand of reconciliation is extended. And God says, come. Well, I, I don't have anything. You don't need money. Come. Are you thirsty for God? Are you thirsty for a change in life? Are you thirsty for a change? In, come. Come. And he extends that hand of reconciliation. Now, he's not going to make you live like a Christian. He's not going to make you be saved, but he will extend the hand and say, come. And this is what he's doing because of Isaiah 53. And we talked about that last week. Incline your ear, come unto me, and hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of death. I will give you life. Come. I'll quicken your spirit. Come. I'll forgive your sins. Come. And the hand's extended. Isn't that great? Wow. <laughs> and then he comes up and says this. Uh, seek ye the Lord. This is verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. Th this indicates a sense of urgency. We get the idea, but don't wait too long. Come before it's too late. No one has guaranteed you tomorrow. Now's the time to seek the Lord. Uh, Psalm 27, 7 is one of my favorite scriptures also in the Old Testament. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou set us seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face I will seek. See, see, that's a matter of determination. It's saying, this is a conscious choice that I will make to seek God. I, I'm, I'm not going to wait for him just to grab hold of me and shake me. I, I, I'm going to seek after him. Amen. Amos 5, 4, for thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, seek you me and you shall live. Seek the Lord. Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all those other things will be added to you. But first of all, seek God. Find God. I wonder sometimes if there's an unknown window to where we can find the Lord. If there's a time period, if there's a gap that as God calls, that if we continue to say no, 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 if that window shuts. If, if, if there's a sense of urgency of seek you the Lord while he may be found is indicating that there may come a time in which he will not be able to be found. You call upon him, but you can't be saved. Uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, John dictates the letter that Jesus is writing. And he says in Revelation 2.20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because you suffer that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed in the house. In other words, there was a philosophy inside the church that was saying it's okay to um, commit fornication. Ah, it's all right if you watch pornography. Ah, it's all right if you lust in your heart after other women. And, and somebody was teaching this, and, and Jesus says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. In other words, he says, I, I gave her a window of opportunity to repent, and she repented not. Therefore, I closed the window. So we see the same thing from the Lord saying, seek you the Lord while he may be found. Strike while the iron's hot. If he's calling you now, now is the time. Don't, don't say, well, I'll do it in a couple of years. I'll do it when I graduate or I'll do it when I retire or I'll do it. Nobody ever guaranteed you that. You better seek the Lord while he's near. Psalm 119 verse 9, wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart I have sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word for seek in the Old Testament means to inquire after. To strive after. Literally to beg. To go after. It's, it, it's, it's not passive. Well, if God hits me in the head of the baseball bat, then he'll have my attention. This is to hunt after, to search after, like some of our deer hunters did this past weekend. They went looking for the deer where the deer are. They put on the right clothes. They put the stinky stuff on their feet so that the deer would not be alerted to them. 
and they went into the woods where deer are known to be found. They hunted. They searched them out. They looked for signs. That's what the Bible is saying. Call upon him while he's near. Go to the place where you will find him. Call upon him while he's near. If you sense the Spirit of God in a song, maybe during an invitation, in your car, listening to a sermon while you're listening to the Word on, 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 on the radio or a song on KVE, if you're at church and God speaks to your heart or at a sunset and when God gives you a special blessing, maybe you got a raise or, or, or somebody gave you a blessing that you were unexpected, then it's saying, call upon him while he's near. Stop and call upon his name. Give him praise. Stop and do what he's asking you to do at that point. Don't put him off. Don't say no. Don't say later. I'll, I'll do it. Don't postpone it. Call upon him while he's near. When he speaks to you now, that's the time to respond. That's the time to act. If he says now's the time to go and give that person a word of encouragement, now's the time they need the encouragement. Don't say, well, I'll do it next week. They may not need it next week. It may, it may be too late next week. Now's the time to go up and say, I'm so glad you're here tonight. You mean so much to me. Your kind words to me, the fact that you came and sat down beside me at the dinner and, and, and you, you spoke to me, that meant so much. Thank you. But call upon God while he's near. Strike while the iron's hot. Don't wait till it gets cold. The second thing is, salvation will affect my thoughts and my ways, okay? So we have our first of saying, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. So here you are in this prison that we've talked about, this dungeon of lostness. The bars are your sins that have just continued to enslave you. Jesus comes down to the dungeon. The light comes on. He sticks the cross into a lock, opens the door, and extends a hand and says, Come, are you thirsty? Come. Struck while the iron's hot. I'm calling now. Come. But when you come, let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Two thoughts here. One, let the wicked forsake his way. When God reaches out the hand of salvation and says, come, we have to leave the prison cell of sin. You can't stay there. Not be saved. If you're going to be saved, you've got to come out of it. That, that, that includes this thing called repentance, turning away from our sin, forsaking our evil ways. We have to forsake our old lifestyle. We have to forsake our old language, our old desires and ambitions, and trade them in for a new set of ways. When you leave the prison, you, you don't come out and start walking around in prison outfit. <laughs> you, you don't come out with striped suit and num numbers across your chest. You, you trade them in for a new set of clothing. You don't wear your prison haircut. You trade them in for a new set of ways. That's why the Bible says we're called to die to self, to die to the old life. That's pictured in baptism, amen? This is the old me. The old me has died to self. We buried him, and I've been risen to walk in newness of life. I'm a new person. God's changing me from the inside to the outside, but I died to the old self. I've, I, I've traded in the old life for a new set of lives. I'm forsaking my old ways for a new set of ways. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, we are buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So we buried that old guy, and we've been risen to walk in newness of life. And then it goes on, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, and says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on the things of this earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. You've traded in the old life for a new set of values, a new language. You don't use those old words anymore. You don't look at the world the same way you used to. Another way of saying this is simple repentance. 
turning from our sin to seek after God as a disciple of Christ. Y'all know what the definition of repentance is. It's that military term that literally says I'm, I'm marching in one direction and they say repent and I turn and do an about face and march the other direction. A lost person, a sinner is walking away from God, walking to his sin. But when God says repent and he calls you to come, you turn away from your sin and turn toward Christ. And you trade in those old values for new values. Second thing is this, let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. This is so important because the true spiritual battlefield for a Christian is in his mind. See, this old body of mine is a body of sin and is going to die. That except Jesus comes back and raptures me up and even at the rapture I'm going to get a new body. This one's got to die. I know it's going to die. And I can take all the vitamins and I can jog and run and lift weights and eat right healthy food. But eventually, I'm going to die. This body's going to die. Amen. My spirit is saved. It's been quickened by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is sealed. I cannot lose that salvation. I mean, I am saved and forever secure. My spirit is right with God. Amen. Amen. But the battlefield is my soul, my mind. It's who I am, okay? And, and I need to realize that because the Bible gives us very, a lot of scriptures. And, and why is that? Because, well, a thought, when you think, a thought becomes an idea. An idea becomes a belief. A belief becomes a truth. A truth becomes a practice. And a practice will eventually become a habit. Why you do what you do in your life started with a thought. Thence, I am to forsake the old thoughts of selfishness and greed and hatred and lust and rebellion. And I've traded the old thoughts in for a superior set of thoughts, the thoughts of God. Amen. That's why Paul wrote in Philippians 4, finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the peace of and the, and the God of peace shall be with you. So the third thing is we're coming up with is God's thoughts are superior. That's a good place for an amen, don't you think? God's thinking, his thoughts are superior. He says in verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God's thoughts are superior. That's why the Bible says that I am to have the same mind in me, which is also in Christ Jesus. I should aspire to think and to have the mind of Christ, not the mind of Sam DeVille. I want to think like Jesus thinks. I want to meditate on the things that Jesus meditated on. When my thoughts and my ways are contrary to what the Bible teaches, then understand my thoughts are inferior to the superior thoughts and ways of God. If I contradict this Bible, my thoughts have gone from superior to inferior Because this is superior thinking versus the inferior thinking of a carnal mind. Now, we've, I've showed you this. Some of y'all are new, so you hadn't seen it, but you need to see it because it's really good. And I know I'm doing a couple of sugar sticky things today, but uh, I've got a couple of boards. So y'all follow with me if you're online. And, and these are what I call the boards of my mind, okay? And God has given me instructions on what I should be doing and what I should not be doing. So, there are sins of commission. That's omission, on commission. I am told in the Word of God not to covet. Amen. Thou shalt not covet. That's one of the Ten Commandments. I am not to steal. I'm not to hate people. 
I'm not to be a glutton. I'm not to curse. I'm not to murmur and complain. I'm not to gossip. I'm not to lie or bear false witness. I am not to be idolatrous. I know these things are things I should not be doing. Amen? So these are sins of commission, things that I am told by the Word of God, superior, do not do. And let me tell you something. This is just a few. I got a whole much bigger board. These are sins of omission. In other words, this is what God has told me I should be doing. I should be praying. I should be content. I should be teaching others the Word of God. I should be witnessing about my faith. I should worship on a regular basis. I should study the Word of God. I should love all people as God loves me. Amen? I should be giving and generous. I should be encouraging. I should be considering how to provoke one another unto love and unto good works. I should be encouraging the brethren and so much more as I see the day approaching. I should be forgiving. I should be truthful. I should work hard. These are things that I know are there. Now, every now and then, some people may irritate me. I'm not saying who. <laughs> Ask Brother Park. He'll tell you. No, I'm just kidding. And I may say, you know, Lord, I, I may love some people, but I'm not going to love that person. They crawl under my skin. They, they, they say ugly things about me behind my back. And I know your word, superior thinking, has told me how in the world can I love God whom I've not seen and say I hate my brethren who I have seen? But Jesus, this square, that you were the Lord of my life, you're not the Lord of my life now. Not in this area called love. No, no, no. Because I'm not going to love that person. Now, that may be the same thing for you saying I'm not going to pray. I don't care if Brother Sam tells me the devil's coming. I'm not praying on Monday day of prayer. I'm not going to do it. He can't make me do it. I'm not going to pray with my wife. I'm not going to pray with my husband. I'm not going to pray for my fellow child. I'm not going to do it. And then you would take that square and take the cross off that square. All right? And say, listen, Lord, you are not the Lord of my life in this area of obedience. Maybe you're stealing something, and you know it's wrong, and you've kicked Jesus off that square and said, get off the square. You're not Lord of this square because I'm not going to do what you've told me to do. So don't, he's not the Lord of that square anymore. Amen? So two things take place when you get Christ off that square. Number one, you're now gone from superior thinking to inferior thinking. You don't have the mind of Christ that God would have you to have. You think you're smarter than God. You think God's a dummy. Why in the world, God, would you tell me to pray? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to honor your name. I'm not going to hallow your name. I'm not going to forgive others as you've forgiven me. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to pray for those that are in leadership like you've told me to do. I'm not going to pray for my pastor and the staff like you've told me to do. I'm not going to pray for my Sunday school teacher. I'm just going to grab and complain. And I'm not going to pray. And you've gone to inferior thinking versus superior thinking. Second thing you've done is you've opened the door for the devil to have a foothold in your life. And, and you have nobody to blame but yourself. So instead of Christ being on there, now you got a big black blob on, blob on there. And Satan looks around and goes, is Jesus the Lord of that area in their life? No. And he takes over that area. And see, what begins to happen is he begins to influence the longer you leave him there and the longer you don't surrender that area of your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ, the longer he stays and the stronger he gets. Because when he first gets there, he builds a little bitty lean-to, and then he builds a shack, and then he builds a cabin, then he builds a house, then he builds a castle, and then he builds a stronghold. 
That's why many Christians have strongholds in their life because they have an area of disobedience. It may be pornography. It may be lying. It may be stealing something at work. I don't know what it is because you got a board just like I got a board, and your board's a lot bigger than this, and my board's a lot bigger than this. This is just an example, but I've got news for you. The longer you leave him there, the more he's going to begin to influence other areas of your life because he's going to go from praying to no longer am I going to give like God wants me to give. And I won't have a spirit of contentment like I used to have. And why in the world can I teach others when I'm not even willing to do what God told me to do myself? And he will begin to spread his influence to other areas of your life, and he will build strongholds there that you're going to have to tear down. And the longer you leave him there, and the longer you live in disobedience in these different areas, in your mind, see, it's your thinking. It all starts with your thinking. I don't need to pray. Bad thought. Anti-scripture. Against what the Word of God says. And any time that you contradict the Word of God, you're kicking God off and you're saying, I'm not going to do what you told me to do. And you allow Satan to come in there. And that is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Because he begins to make bridges to places like love. Well, I'm not going to pray for those people. But if you really loved them, you would. You pray for your children. And it spreads. And before long, this beautiful mind that is surrounded by the love of Jesus Christ and the light of Christ becomes very, very dark. And it all starts and ends with your thinking, with your thinking, okay? And you're saying, all right, Brother Sam, you have to show me what that means, okay? I got scriptures for you then. All right, let's go. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. And that you put on the new man, of, uh, the new man which after God is creating righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying. Er, speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for you are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Quit giving him places in your mind. Let him that stole steal no more, rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may give to him which is needful. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but that which is of good and the use of edifying, that it may minister grace into his hearing. In other words, he's saying, quit knocking Jesus off the squares and giving places to Satan in your heart and in your mind. The problem The longer you let him stay, the more his tentacles spread out to other areas. So this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome. He says, "For I, I, this is Romans 7, verse 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I, I, I delight the Word of God. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Oh, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then when my mind, I I myself serve the law of God, but the flesh of the law of sin. In other words, he's saying there's a battle in you between the flesh and the spirit. Okay, now if you're saved... You, you've got the spirit, the, your spirit has been quickened, you've got the Holy Spirit in you, but I want you to know the flesh is not gone. And there's a war. They, they, they fight against each other. It's like two dogs inside you that are fighting. And you wake up in the morning and think, you know, I really ought to have a quiet time this morning. And, and th- this other side goes, no, just watch the, the, the Three Stooges on TV. Well, I really need to apologize to my wife. No, make her come begging back to you. And and there's this battle, and you know that battle because you fight that battle all the time. Maybe you got angry and you said something you knew you shouldn't have said, a a word that you would have been ashamed to have said at church, but you said it, and you know God's going, listen, you need to go and ask forgiveness. You need to go and say, oh, God, forgive me for doing that. I know that was wrong. But Satan goes, don't do it. No, you're a tough guy. You used to be in the Navy. You can say those words because Navy guys curse like sailors. <laughs> you have those battles inside you. 
And you need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit versus what Satan. And it goes further in verse, uh, Romans 8, uh, 1 saying, uh, For there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life of Jesus Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son the likeness of sinful uh, flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they, are of that, they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity, it's at war against God, for it is not the subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, and so be it the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So you, you've got this choice to either be uh, spiritually minded or carnally minded. And the battle is there. And you should not ever be content to be carnally minded. Because if you do, it's inferior thinking versus superior thinking. That's why he wrote in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And be you not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we go further. God's thoughts will bear fruit. Listen to verse 10. This is back to Isaiah 55. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and, bring, and what, make it bring forth fruit, and make forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be to him that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing hitherto I have sent it. God's word will not return in him void. Even as the rain falls and waters the seeds in the garden, so the word of God will impact the listener. That's why I preach from the Bible. You don't need to hear my words, my soul, but the words of God are power. That's where our doctrine comes from, amen? It's because that's the rain that makes the seeds grow. It's because the word of God is what brings conviction to bring sinners to Christ. That's why we love the Word of God. That's why we want the Word of God. As a youth minister, I, I, you'd always have some smart aleck kid come in, you know, thinking he was too cool for school and just, huh. and you can see the attitude when, while you're teaching. Because I would tell the, the youth, I'd say, listen, now when we play, we're going to play hard. But when we study, we're going to study hard. So when you come into my Bible studies, and I had them every Sunday night and Wednesday night, I said, no soda pops, no candy in here, okay? So... While you're in my Bible study, you're to have a notebook and a Bible, and we're going to do Bible study, and we did actual Bible study. And, and, and some of them were just like, oh. And, and I would go, that's fine, because you're here. And the Word's going to get you eventually. And you'll either get so mad at the Word that you'll quit and go, or you're going to surrender to the will of Almighty God. And one of the worst was the preacher's kid. And this was the first church I was a youth minister at, and the preacher's kid was a senior, and he was living a carnal lifestyle, and he thought he was ruling the roost because daddy's a preacher and nobody can do anything to me. And he didn't realize, I don't care who your daddy is. I'm the youth minister, and you're under me. So he came to the door. This is a true story. He came to the door of Bible study at 6 o'clock at night, and, and he had a Dr. Pepper in his hand. And he did this intentionally. He came in and just popped it right in front of me. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm going to Bible study. I said, not with that Dr. Pepper, you're not. Well, what am I supposed to do with it? I said, I don't know. I'd drink it if I were you. He said, well, I said, you got, you got one minute to drink that thing. And I pulled my watch. I said, you got one minute to drink that thing. He said, well, I just don't know if I can drink it, Dr. I said, now you got 50 seconds. You better hurry up. And he started drinking, started running bubbles out his nose and stuff. I said, I do not care. You come on in. You act like, like, you know, you rule the world, but you don't rule in here, my friend. And you're going to learn the Word of God, and it's going to impact you. Now, it was several months later, and we had a youth service, okay? 
And I was preaching during a youth service. And because he had a really good voice, they said, listen, you the preacher's son, you get to lead the music. Mm. <laughs> so I preached my sermon, and he gets up, and he starts leading the invitation. And the song is, All to Jesus I Surrender. He choked up. Couldn't sing it. Because he'd be lying. And I remember him coming down during the invitation, and he was weeping. And saying, I can't sing that song because I'd be singing a lie. And and he recommitted his life to Christ and became one of my greatest young people. And I believe it was not because of Sam, it was because of the Word of God. Sunday school teachers, teach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. But it's the Word. It's the Word. We've got to teach and preach the Word of God. Amen? It's a double-edged sword. It's rain that will bear much fruit. Don't give up. Don't despair. It may take time, but the power is in the Word. Keep preaching the Word. Be, 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 be right with the Word, okay? And then number five, God's thoughts will change your attitude. Listen to verse 12. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorns shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. Boy, doesn't that remind you of just Julie Andrews going, The hills are alive. <laughs> Duh. See, it's all perception. It really is. She just had that spirit of, of, of Christ. That's why she was so happy. We all wake up to the same sunrise. Some will wake up with a song in their heart, at least after the first cup of coffee. <laughs> They'll have a kind word, a word of thanksgiving for a great night's sleep, a roof over their head, food in the refrigerator, good health, an invaluable salvation, water from the tap, They'll be thankful for their family, their electricity, the freedom to pray, the freedom to vote, the freedom to read your Bible. I mean, they just, they, they're just, you know, full of joy. And, and, and literally, it's like the Scripture saying that they shall go, go out with joy and be led forth with peace. They, they just have a song in their heart. And some will wake up to the same sunset moping around, griping and complaining about the temperature. It's too hot or it's too cold. It's never just right. Or about having to go to work. Not thankful that they have a job, but I've got to go to work. Mad at the school bus they got behind. Mad at the rain or the lack of rain. And their board is black and some shining bright. Same sunset. Same area of East Texas. Totally different perception. How do you see life? Are you positive? Are you filled with love and joy and peace? Are you the eternal pessimist? It's not genetic. Please don't tell me, well, my daddy was mean because I got, I got the right to be mean. My daddy lost his temper. I can lose my temper. That's hogwash. Amen? Amen? You've come out of that prison. God's changed your attitude. Now your thoughts need to be God's thoughts. You need to have the same mind in you which is also in Christ Jesus. You need to be optimistic. You need to be the light that enters the room, not the old gripe gut and sourpuss. <laughs> Somebody with a sourpuss look on their face, always something to gripe about, thinking the worst of people. What a sad, sad existence, amen? It's simply a sign of inferior carnal thinking in the flesh versus a superior mind of Christ. I told you, I love this story. Uh, I was in Mount Pleasant, and I pastored a church called Delwood Baptist Church. And a, a little church on the north side of Mount Pleasant called me. The pastor called me. He said, I would like for you to come and do a revival at our church. I said, no, I don't think so. He said, yeah, I really want you to come. I said, no. I said, number one, I'm really not good at revivals. I'm better at, it, if I got anything, it's, it's preaching at the same church all the time. I'm not good at revivals. And uh, second, I really don't want to do one in Mount Pleasant. He said, why not? I said, well, if I come and preach, I'm going to preach a sugar stick, and, and they may like my preaching, and if they left your church and came to my church, I'd feel really bad. <laughs> so I, I'd rather, he said, oh, that one, just come on. I want you to come and preach. I've heard good things about you. You come and preach at my church revival. And finally I said, okay, I'll come. I'll come. 
So I go to this church, and this is a true story. I, I, I would never embellish a story. Y'all know that. <laughs> and, but this is really, really true. And, and I, I, I go there, and Sunday, I'm telling you, I preach hard. I preach a great sermon because I'm pulling out my sugar sticks. Those are your best sermons, you know, like woodpecker sermons and stuff like that. And, and give the invitation and nothing. I'm telling you, nobody comes down. Nobody. I could have put money on the altar. They wouldn't have come pick it up. <laughs> Sunday night, I took two sugar sticks and combined them into one sermon. So it was a double sugar stick sermon and still nothing. Nobody moved. I mean, they were just sitting there like, during the invitation. And y'all know what invitations are supposed to be like. Amen. Great altar calls. Nothing. Nothing. Monday night, preach hard. Nothing. Nothing. Nobody moves. Tuesday night, finally. Finally, a movement of the Holy Spirit. People come down the altar. Some families are getting right with each other. You can see that God is moving in a great way. Man, I was so inspired. I said, yes, finally. God's broke. This is wonderful. This is fantastic. So at the end of the service, the preacher would come down. He'd say, okay, uh, Keith, dismiss us in a word of prayer. And while that person is praying, me and the preacher would walk back to the back. See, we sneak back to the back during the prayer. Y'all knew that, right? Okay, so we snuck back to the back, and I'm in the foyer, and this guy's up there praying, and I, and I lean down to the preacher, and I say, boy, what a great altar call. And he turned to me, and he went, they don't mean it. <laughs> and I went, what? He goes, they don't mean it. They'll be just as mean tomorrow as they were last week. <laughs> and I'm like, then why did you invite me here? You pessimistic dog. I didn't call him that, but I was like, you're the preacher. You don't think your people can change. You don't think a heart can turn. You don't think that God can save. What are you doing as you're the preacher? It's all in your attitude. I, I, I was ready to win the whole city to Jesus. This guy didn't even believe his own people coming to the altar and praying meant business. What's your attitude? Truthfully, what's your attitude? Because that's going to be the mirror of how you think. People don't have to see your board. All they got to do is look at your face and your attitude. And, the, and they can know what's on your board, whether it's under the lordship of Jesus Christ, whether you surrendered everything and said, listen, we're having an eviction notice. Devil, you get out. I am, I am surrendering my life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And if he says to do it, I'm going to do it because his thinking is superior to my thinking. Doesn't make a difference what I think. It's what he thinks. It's what his word says. And that's what I'm going to do. How's your thinking? I love the story, and I'll close with this, of the hiding place. It's the story of Corey Ten Boone of how her family hid Jews during the German occupation in their house. And finally, they got caught. And when they got caught, her and her sister and her family were taken to a prison. And eventually, they would end up in Ravensbrück uh, concentration camp. And uh, her sister's name was Bess, or Betsy, and uh, they were there side by side in, in the prison camp, at a concentration camp. And literally, the only way Corey Ten Boone was uh, saved from the gas chamber is they made a mistake, a clerical error, that, and they released her because the next week she would have gone to the gas chamber. So she would have never been able to write the hiding place or anything. But on December 16th, 1944, her sister Betsy died. Now, just before she died, she did a couple of things, okay? First of all, she was praying, and, and they would have services inside their barracks, and she was praying and saying, oh, God, thank you so much for the bed bugs. And, God, I, and, and, and Corey stopped her midstream and said, you got to stop. No, 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 no. I can do a lot of things. I can sit there and watch you tithe off the little piece of bread that you get. I, I can see your happy disposition. But now that you're praying and thanking God for the bed bugs, that's it. I cannot go there. I don't know what in the world is in your mind, but, it, but it's not right. And Betsy said, oh, Corey, don't you know? 
that because we've got bed bugs so bad in our area of the barracks, the guards won't come back here, and therefore we have this small portion of Scripture that is safe, and they won't find it. And we've got a little bit of the Bible because of these precious bed bugs. Wow. And, and, and then she told her this. Let me, let me read you this quote because I don't have it memorized. She said, there is no pit so deep that he, God, is not deeper still. In a concentration camp, being worked to death on starvation, fighting bed bugs, fighting German guards and their cruelty, and eventually would starve to death, giving her food to others that she thought less fortunate. Oh, no, no, it's not your circumstances. It's who your Lord is. It's what you're thinking. And whether you've surrendered your thought life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ or whether you're doing it on your own, whether you say, no, 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 I'm smarter than God. I got news for you. You want superior thinking? You need to think like Christ thought up in the Word of God. Amen? Okay, so I, I'm done. That's, I love that. Okay, so let's stand. We're going to dismiss with a word of prayer.